so I'll go ahead and introduce our guest speaker today, and that's Dr. David Weir, and he is a project leader in the Forest Economics and Policy Unit with the USDA Forest Service Southern Research Station. And um, he is going to speak today regarding the Southern Forest Futures Project that was coordinated by the USDA Forest Service. And with that, I'll give Dr. Weir the floor. Looks like he might be having some audio difficulties that his um, microphone icon just disappeared. There it goes. Okay, I was pushing the wrong button. Apologies. <laughs> um, so, so it's a pleasure to be here today to give you a, a presentation on the, um, the findings of the Southern Forest Futures Project, an effort that, that I co-led with uh, John Grice uh, with the Southern Region of the Forest Service. It involved more than 50 people, uh, a large group of scientists and analysts from across the South, largely from the Forest Service, but also from a number of, of universities throughout the region. This effort uh, started about four years ago with uh, a set of public meetings to try to gauge the, uh, the interests and the concerns of, of people focused in the forest sector of the South and uh, then led into a fairly um, uh, extensive analysis of many issues that I'll, I'll describe here in a minute. But as I get into this, you know, the, the first question that should come to mind is, you know, why would we want to undertake this four-year effort to, to look at the future of forests in the South? And, and perhaps for most people on, on the line, it's pretty obvious. Um, uh, for many, many other people in the region, perhaps it's not. Uh, but it's clear that the, the 200 million acres of southern forest provide many goods, services, and values to the citizens of the South and uh, increasingly to uh, the citizens of the nation through, through its economic contributions. We also know that there are a number of things um, underway, or excuse me, a number of forces of change underway that are applying multiple pressures to forests and, and affecting their, their current condition as well as the trajectory of future conditions. So in response to what was perceived as not only an increasing number of pressures on southern forests, but also an accelerating rate of change in, in a number of areas. The Forest Service, along with the Southern Group of State Foresters, charted the Southern Forest Futures Project to, to look carefully at uh, the potential change in the future and how it might be affected by these multiple forces of change. So the process that we used was was designed by, by John Grice and I uh, as uh, what we called a science-based futuring analysis um, that involved looking at a number of uh, plausible futures, uh, looking at scenarios for future development in terms of economics, climate, um, and, and other related vectors of change, and, and using that as, as a platform then for discussing the, the potential implications of, of change for forest conditions, forest area, and uh, this whole suite of ecosystem services that are derived from forests in the region. But throughout this, we, we were careful to design a process that we hoped would, would translate uh, this, this fairly vast literature on, uh, on the science of these, these various issues into something that would be usable uh, from the perspective of both policymakers and managers. So that had an influence on how we designed the, the analysis, and it also had an influence on how we designed the products that are, that are still being developed from this project. So to give you an overview of those products, um, here, here's what we're producing with the Southern Forest Futures Project. Uh, we've, we've completed uh, the phase one of the project. Um, <laughs> I say completed, we're in the final production uh, stage of, the, of phase one, where we've completed a region-wide assessment that's looked at uh, a variety of scenarios regarding future change and a set of, uh, a set of issues, um, you know, we call these meta-issues, which were basically packages of, of concerns surrounding a particular topic. Uh, one, one area would be fire, another would be water, um, things like uh, forest ownership. So we've produced a technical report 
and the uh, date May 2011 is when we actually released um, the public review draft of, of the technical report and, and something called the summary report, which is a 75-page document uh, that I think some of you have read, which uh, we see as a compact synthesis of the findings and implications. Again, with an eye toward trying to translate um, this this 17-chapter uh, report, which is likely to be on the order of 800 pages long, into something that's a little bit more uh, consumable by a broader public. We we did release this in May 2011. Uh, received uh, public comments, and then we've revised and and uh, we are in the production process to get the final version of that out um, in a print form as well as on the internet. Phase two is an is a process that is ongoing. Uh, we've um, we've deployed five separate teams to look at the implications of the technical report um, for management in in separate subregions of the South. So in each of these subregions, we've asked a scientist as well as a uh, public land manager uh, to uh, lead a team to translate the findings into forest management implications. And as I recall, yes, the, the next slide shows a map of those uh, subregions. So, so we've basically used um, uh, a biophysical, um, you know, ecological section type of uh, uh, subregional definition in a couple of places. Uh, tweaked the the boundaries a bit to to be more um, consistent with some uh, political or or um, you know, jurisdictional boundaries that, that made sense. So these are the the five subregions. There's the um, the coastal plain, the Piedmont, the, technically the Southern Appalachian Piedmont, and then the Appalachian Cumberland subregion, and then the Mississippi alluvial valley, and then a region that we've called the Mid South. One thing you'll note is that um, uh, in previous assessments, we've always stopped in eastern Texas and uh, eastern Oklahoma. Um, at the urging of at least two state foresters, uh, we've extended the analysis uh, to, to look at drivers of change throughout those two states, a broader, a broader footprint for uh, regional assessment. To conduct the, the futures project, um, we've gone through three phases. One called a, um, a forecasting analysis where we forecasted forest conditions and, and used that as a foundation for examining implications for natural resources and ecosystem services. We've also dug deep into a series of uh, 13 meta-issues, uh, large groups of, of issues surrounding a particular topic. And then the third phase, the third stage then is the uh, the sub-regional analysis that I that I just described. Before we got going on any of this, however, we, we decided to go out to the public and ask what the issues were. And we called public meetings in each of the 13 southern states, uh, plus a couple of additional ones. Uh, we had more than 600 people attend these meetings in the winter of 2008. And uh, through a facilitated workshop that lasted most of the day, we uh, gathered um, quite a bit of input. I think it was uh, better than 2,200 uh, specific comments about what uh, people saw as the um, the big issues with with regard to forest in their particular region, and their perspective on what was happening across the region. Uh, these these meetings were attended largely by people with active interest in the forest sector. There were a lot of people from. Uh, you know, forest uh, industry groups, uh, uh, NGOs, uh, conservation and environmental groups, but also a large number of private landowners who had a uh, strong interest in, in these issues. We then convened a technical analysis team with about 50 scientists and analysts. And, and a final point is that every, every one of the chapters and every report is receiving very thorough peer review to make sure that we're not missing something and that we, we really are uh, providing a, a, an adequate and an accurate synthesis of the science around these issues. Here's a, a chapter outline to give you a feeling for the, uh, the breadth of the work that was conducted. Uh, we, we have a chapter on the design of the, the project. 
um, a chapter that looks at how to construct alternative futures. And the futures that we used were connected to uh, national uh, scenarios for the RPA assessment, uh, which in turn were tiered to the IPCC, or the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change scenarios that, that have organized an awful lot of, of uh, climate and other analysis. Uh, then a series of chapters that look at, at forecast, climate change, land uses, forest conditions, and then an exploration of several of these meta issues that I've, I've mentioned, forest ownership, uh, demographics and recreation, um, timber products, bioenergy, taxes, jobs and income, water, wildlife and biodiversity, invasive plants, forest insects and diseases, and fire. Each of these chapters is a very um, thorough science synthesis based on the literature in, in each of the topic areas. So scenarios are, are really key to how we look to the future. Um, and and if you've if you've thought about this at all, you understand that there's you know there, there's a real challenge in constructing useful useful scenarios for this type of analysis. Um, the the scenarios that one chooses um, really should be what I'd call coherent scenarios, so that the multiple factors that that determine the future are somehow or another interlinked. Uh, for example, we we know that there are, are multiple climate models out there, uh, general circulation models that generate um, you know variable forecast with respect to to climate. But but the thing that uh, you know we have to keep in mind is that behind those climate forecasts are a number of assumptions and um, and integrated forecasts of things like population and uh, economic growth and income um, at, a, at a spatially refined um, level. Um, and, and if we're thinking about forests, we need to be thinking about forest product markets as well. And, and those need to be tied into these other, other aspects of, of the scenarios. So it, what that meant is we, need, we needed to uh, tie our scenarios to something that, that was coherent for a, for a global future. And this led us to, to begin with the RPA scenarios and was the logic that the RPA used to, to, uh, to, atta to attach their scenarios to the IPCC work. In, in that case, there were global economic forecasts, global emissions forecasts that could be, then be tied to GCMs and the like. So we selected a family of scenarios uh, what we've called cornerstone futures, and, and while I'm, I'm, you know, reluctant to uh, to generate jargon, uh, we use the term cornerstone futures to to describe that these these futures that we've selected were based on looking at a very large number of scenarios. Um, I, I believe we we looked at 152 scenarios using many permutations of climate models and the like. And, and then we, we boiled it down to these six that we think sort of captured the range of, of futures that, that were um, embedded in that, in that, um, that full suite of, of futures. Now, obviously, we, um, you know, describing six, uh, the outcomes for six futures is challenge enough for a document like this. Um, you can imagine what it would be like for 152. So the cornerstone futures are, again, uh, futures that we felt captured a range of plausible future scenarios that were that were um, uh, going to be the foundation of our analysis for the futures project. To do much of the the analysis, uh, uh, you know, it, it, at least the forecasting analysis, we used a, a forecasting system, uh, a set of interlinked models that that projects um, land use, um, forest inventory and uh, wood products markets links those things to uh, water use and, and uh, water stress, uh, wildlife habitat, and things like carbon, uh, forecasts of carbon stored in forests. All of these forecasts are driven by the scenario data, which would be on the left-hand side of, of this particular graph, which includes the economic projections, the emissions projections, population, and income, as well as climate. The, uh, the economic uh, projections that are of, of most interest for our forecasting is personal income, uh, which we've downscaled to uh, the county level. Likewise, population, 
forecasts are, are downscaled to the, the county level. And the climate data have been downscaled uh, to a very fine resolution and then for much of our modeling upscaled back to a county to allow for some of the inventory forecasting that, that we use here in the south. Uh, the, the forest inventory data, the FIA data plays a central role and much of what we're doing with this model is, is projecting a very detailed uh, uh, future for the forest inventory plots that comprise the forest inventory system in the south. So um, it's worth mentioning that this is um, this, this futures project really is um, an extension of, of what I see as an ongoing and expanding conversation about forest sustainability in the region. Uh, this region is, is unique in the United States in having this kind of coherent conversation over time. It started back in, 1960, in, the, in the late 60s uh, with a report called the South's Third Forest. Um, it, it looked at a series of questions about whether or not uh, the timber industry could grow in the South um, and what it would take for that, that industry to grow. It was focused on timber scarcity and, um, and on the ability of the private sector to provide to provide timber for a growing, for a growing industry. It, um, it foresaw uh, quite a bit of the growth, or it, it, it saw growth potential that has indeed been realized. So we got into the 80s then, um, after the you know, growth had been realized in, in many parts of the South. Uh, the Forest Service uh, convened a team to look at um, the future of the forest sector. Again, it was, it was largely focused on uh, timber questions with some other resource consequences um, uh, mentioned, I should say. Um, some, some, you know, touching on, on recreation and wildlife. And that, that resulted in a report called the South's Fourth Forest in, in 1987 or 88. Um, in 2002, we released um, um, another report and assessment that looked looked at the sustainability of southern forests uh, called the Southern Forest Resource Assessment. However, this, this report looked beyond the forest product sector as a, as a force of change. It, it looked fairly carefully at land use change and the potential for population growth and income growth to, to have an influence on, on the future of forest. So it was, it was focused not, not on the forest landscape per se, but on the south as a whole on the economy of the South as a whole and how that might influence the future of forest conditions. It also focused very, very explicitly on multiple resources and services derived from those, those forests. It looked carefully at, at a number of water issues, wetlands and, and BMPs and, and the like. It also looked at uh, wildlife and biodiversity issues related to, to changing forest conditions. And so the, the, the Southern Forest Futures Project uh, which is coming 10 years after the Southern Forest Resource Assessment, in many ways is, an, is built on the foundation of the Southern Forest Resource Assessment. In some cases, we looked at uh, the analysis from SFRA and determined that, that we didn't have much more to say about it, given the, the way that the science had evolved. Um, but in other cases, it's representing um, an extension of, of the SFRA and taking on uh, some additional questions. and is now a much more integrated um, analysis so that we're looking at common scenarios across across resource issues and focusing on a, on a broader suite of resource issues. So next I'm going to, to um, look at a series of, um, I don't know, status and trends with respect to, to forest conditions in the south to set to set the uh, the context for for looking at the findings of the futures project first thing to start with is is that the south is a well wooded region if you look across the region there's there's um, better than 200 million acres of forests if we look on a county by county basis and in, in many counties of the forested part of the south we find better than 80 percent forest cover Perhaps not as well appreciated as the diversity of forest conditions in in the in the region, uh, with roughly 35% uh, in some kind of uh, a pine forest condition. 
16% lowland hardwood, excuse me, 39% upland hardwood. Forest ownership um, is is an interesting um, <laughs> dynamic these days in the South. Uh, roughly roughly 88% of, of southern forests are in private ownership uh, with, with a fairly substantial change in ownership pattern occurring over the last 10 years. Uh, we now, you know, whereas, whereas 10 years ago we would have described private ownership in the south as either industrial or forest industry land or non-industrial land, um, now since there is practically no uh, forest industry land left, uh, we, we've changed our terminology a bit and refer to family-owned forests, which is far and away the dominant forest ownership type in the region, and other private, which in most cases is a corporate ownership, would include timber investment management organizations, um, as well as real estate investment trusts, and the, and the forest industry land that it has left in the region. The South is also a highly productive timber economy. Um, the uh, the region in in the 1960s was roughly equivalent to the Pacific Northwest in total in terms of total timber harvest, uh, but since then has grown to um, to produce a little bit better than 60 percent of all timber products in the United States, uh, far outpacing um, the other regions of the country, and growing while the western regions have have declined. The region also has an enormous biological diversity. As a matter of fact, in the, in the lower 48, this is far and away the most diverse um, subregion um, in, in the country. Um, this is a map of the county level uh, native uh, terrestrial vertebrate species. And uh, the numbers are hard to read, <laughs> but the darker numbers are in excess of 350 species uh, within each of those counties. And increasingly, that biodiversity includes some unwanted biota, um, increasing numbers of, of invasive plants in southern forests and grasslands, um, as well as a, a growing, growing number of, of exotic um, insects and diseases affecting forest conditions in the, in the region. In addition, the South's population and economy are growing. Um, and have grown uh, since the 1970s at rates that are greater than the U.S. as a whole. So we've gone from from about 56 million people in the South in um, in 1970 to about 106 million um, in 2010. Uh, the projections have typically said that we should expect 120 million uh, by the year 2020. And uh, well. You can do the math. That's roughly a doubling of the population since 1970. Uh, personal income and total earnings have also grown at a fairly substantial clip, and at a clip that's much higher than for the nation as a whole. Uh, so we, we have more people, and we have more affluence in terms of of, of the population. And, and this has important implications for how we consume natural resources and especially how land is developed in the region. So next I want to, uh, to present the 10 key findings of the Futures Project. And I mentioned that the summary report is a synthesis of the 17 chapters. And this is pretty much what is contained in the uh, summary report obviously with more detail, but what we've tried to do is to look across those 17 chapters um, and, and, and pull out what we see as the top 10 uh, findings uh, fr from that, that detailed analysis. Key finding number one is that a combination of four factors will interact to shape the South's forests. Those four factors are population growth, climate change, timber markets, and invasive species. I'll observe that they, they don't all operate on the same time frame and aren't all operating in the same way in each of the subregions. But as we looked at the, our forecast 
clear that that it's um, the interaction of all of these factors and not one factor alone or in isolation uh, that, that will influence the condition of forests um, in going to the future. The um, the top chart shows the um, population growth for our different cornerstone futures and shows the range of population growth that we um, that we evaluated. The graph, or excuse me, the map at the bottom there shows patterns of population growth between 2010 and 2060 for uh, Cornerstone A. And the blue shows um, areas that we would expect to see increased populations, and the darkest blue show the most increase in, in population. The darkest blue color shows an increase of more than 750 people per square mile. And I, the way I think about it is that the um, the population density of Mecklenburg County right now is about 750 per, per square mile. So that's an additional Mecklenburg County density on top of the density that's there already. The other interesting part of this this map is the green areas. And these are these are areas where the projections suggest that uh, population will actually decline into the future. So while we have an increasing population in, in the south, it's suggesting that the population will be concentrated in a smaller portion of the landscape uh, with, um, with a decline in, in, in many rural areas. Here's one way to look at the interactions. Um, income and population and future timber prices uh, have have strong influences and interacting influences on on losses in forest area. So here we've looked across four cornerstone futures at at the amount of forest that we expect to be lost between 2010 and 2060, and um, if we look at the difference between A and B and between C and D. Uh, those are futures that have the same um, economic and population futures, but have different timber market futures. So the the bottom line there is that with um, with population and income growth held constant, if we increase the value of forest, then we we don't lose as much forest into the future. But all three of those things interact to determine that future forest area. Key finding two is about urbanization, and this this is a finding that carries over from the Southern Forest Resource Assessment, and it is that urbanization is forecasted to result in forest losses, increased carbon emissions, and stress on other forest resources. Our projections of urbanization uh, show an increase of between 30 and 43 million acres by 2060, and that translates into forest losses of between 11 and 23 million acres by the year 2060. 23 million acres is about the size of South Carolina. And that's a fairly substantial loss. Even at the low end, it's a substantial loss. And this is something that's different from, from what we found in the Southern Forest Resource Assessment. Uh, Ten years ago, as we looked at land use projections, we saw that there would be a, a plausible uh, future of no net loss that would sort of carry forward trends that we've seen since the 50s, where we've had increased urbanization uh, but at the same time, we've had the diversion of agricultural land to forest land. And um, you know, much of this was supported by conservation programs like the Conservation Reserve Program. But as we look from today forward, we see little opportunity for, for strong offsetting of urbanization gains with continued loss of, of agricultural land and increase in, in forest and rural areas. So that's an important um, difference from what we saw in the Southern Forest Resource Assessment. This is um, a chart showing um, percentage loss of forest uh, between 2010 and 2060, in this case from a 1997 base uh, for the different subregions uh, that, I, that I described earlier. It's clear that the, uh, the subregion with the greatest forest loss would be the Piedmont with more than 20% of forest loss within that subregion, and, and where we expect to see much of the population growth concentrated. 
The uh, Southern Appalachians and the uh, Coastal Plain are, are in the second position there. But it's worth mentioning that if we boil this down to an even finer scale, if we looked at uh, uh, sections within each of those subregions, we'd find that um, the you know the the peninsula of Florida would continue to lose forests at at the fastest rate of any small section within the within the south, and we'd expect to see roughly a thirty percent loss of forest area in the peninsula of Florida, just driven by population and income. Now, one thing to mention is that um, land use forecasts are are clearly driven by by population growth. So that more people um, mean more developed land and, and and more urban areas. What what is also interesting is that that income interacts with that population growth in, in really strong ways. So that um, it's as as income goes up, the uh, the amount of land consumed per increase in the population in grows as well. So that um, the um, you know, these forecasts are, are very sensitive to, to income forecasts um, going into the future. Key finding number three, southern forests could sustain higher timber production levels, but demand is the limiting factor and demand growth is uncertain. We, uh, we project uh, that, that timber supply will continue to grow. Uh, going into the future. And, and this can be seen by the growth in, in uh, planted pine over the, the last 10 years. We've seen roughly a doubling of planted pine area over the last 20 years, with much of that growth coming in the last decade when, um, when the, um, you know, the, the, the amount of timber production was actually in decline in the south. Um, so that we have an expanded area of intensively managed forests, but we've also come through a period where um, harvest demand has been down and we continue to grow um, grow supply on the stump as well as expand the capacity to, uh, to produce from, from planted pine. What, what that means is that um, with even moderate demand growth, we don't really see much in the way of a strong upward pressure on prices. In other words, if the sector was to sort of move along at current levels or to return to a very moderate or to a fairly moderate um, expansion in growth, we could we could see an increase in timber production uh, with very little movement in timber prices, um, at least from the levels that we saw in 2006. One would hope that some of the prices we're seeing today in the in the midst of the housing recession would would um, would come up over time. As we tried to, to look at um, you know, the, the range of, of potential um, changes in, in timber markets, we could see the, the opportunity to expand timber harvesting again over the 2006 levels by as much as 70% without a structural change in, in the region. In other words, uh, continuing to plant forests at about the same rates that we saw in the past, uh, moderate growth and productivity. Could could realize up to a 70% expansion in in timber product output. And I think I've said all of these things. Oh well, it's worth mentioning that <clears throat> much of the growth in in output would be concentrated in a fairly small area, well, relative to the, the entire region, and that is the southeastern coastal plain. Uh, so that's where productivity growth has has occurred. Um, over the last 30 years, and it's where we would expect productive capacity to expand if it were to expand in the region. Key finding four um, is about bioenergy, and it's worth mentioning that that um, when we did our public comments, or excuse me, our, our public scoping um, in the winter of 2008, this this was a question that was perhaps the most important. Um, for for you know, the 600 people who participated in these meetings, they they had a variety of perspectives on whether uh, you know whether it was desirable or not to see a strong bioenergy future. Uh, they had concerns about uh, whether or not we had the capacity to to uh, 
to produce for a bioenergy sector without um, adversely affecting the existing industry. They had concerns about the, uh, the ecological and the biophysical implications of increased production for bioenergy. Uh, the finding here is that uh, bioenergy futures uh, could bring demands that are large enough to trigger changes in forest conditions, management, and markets. Um, as we looked across the various uh, wood using sectors, it seems that, that uh, bioenergy has the highest potential to provide some kind of demand growth. Uh, as we looked at demand scenarios, uh, bioenergy demand scenarios, it, uh, it, it was clear that the, the bioenergy demand scenarios from the Department of Energy were, were such that they would exhaust wood waste and, and um, residuals fairly rapidly and lead to a strong demand for raw material, in particular for softwood pulpwood, and uh, that bioenergy would compete with traditional wood products markets um, at, at these, uh, these DOE scenario levels. The forecasts uh, from the bioenergy analysis suggested an additional 54 to 113 percent over 2006 harvest levels by 2050. And if you'll recall from the previous key finding, we think that we can go up to about 70 percent uh, without any kind of structural change in the, in the sector. So the scenarios, at least the DOE is considering right now, uh, would mean some kind of structural change at the high end. And where would that structural change come from? It's likely to come from expanding planted pine area. Um, I mentioned it, you know, that this, this chart bears some, some explanation. This is uh, forest, uh, forest types in the south uh, from 1952 to the present, about 2010, and then two projections of, of those forest types. So we'll start with the red. This is uh, naturally regenerated pine. Uh, the purple is lowland hardwood, the blue is oak pine or mixed pine hardwood, and the green is upland hardwood. Finally, the orange, um, assuming that your screen shows the same colors as mine, is, um, is planted pine. This, um, this chart shows that, um, again, we've, we went from about zero planted pine acres in, the, in 1950 to about 40 million acres of planted pine in, um, in 2010, with about half of that growth occurring since 1990. <clears throat> As we looked to the future, we, we saw a range of possible planted pine um, scenarios. Uh, the, the, the lowest would be really a, 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 a rapid slowing of accumulation in planted pine with a, a maximum of 47 million acres by the year 2060. Uh, but the high end, we saw a, a growth that pretty much continued the, the growth that we had seen over the last 30 years into the future, um, and, and would be about 67 million acres by, by 2060. A fairly, fairly substantial increase uh, going up to, to about 23 percent of forest land in the south being planted pine. Key finding number five is that a combination of factors have the potential to decrease water availability and degrade water quality, uh, and that forest conservation and management can help to mitigate these effects. We, uh, in this chapter, looked at the effects of various drivers on, um, on water stress in the, in the south, including climate, and population growth, and that influence on demand, land use change associated with population uh, growth, and um, and then evaluated uh, the future uh, based on the, on the water stress index. It's clear that, that there are several areas that are going to uh, continue to have uh, growing, growing concerns for water quality and, and water availability in the south. And, and if you think back, uh, I believe it's three years ago that we had fairly pervasive drought conditions throughout the southeast. and, and um, had to uh, engage water restrictions or water use restrictions to, to stretch out our water supplies. You might be able to extrapolate that into the future by saying, well, you know, even if we don't have a change in climate, um, a fairly strong increase in population to the year 2060 would, would increase demand and have that kind of influence on, on current water systems. Uh, so as, as 
this team looked at, at water stress into the future, population and land use change uh, dominate, but uh, precipitation forecasts, which are somewhat variable across the futures, could have a bearing on on the future of water supply in in several areas, especially in um, the um, the mid south, the um, you know, areas of Arkansas and and, um, and Texas and Oklahoma. This chart shows um, the change in urban cover for some important watersheds. And the darkest color here shows where we would expect to have uh, a more than 100% uh, change in or a doubling of, of urban cover for, for the counties within these, these watersheds, the Roanoke, the Santee, and the Altamaha. Key finding number six, invasive species um, will continue to create a great but uncertain potential for ecological change and economic losses. Uh, we've seen the emergence of, of key invasive insect and disease pests uh, since the Southern Forest Resource Assessment. Um, you know, the, the uh, perhaps one of the more profound realizations <laughs> in looking across the two is that there are several new um, uh, pests uh, over the last 10 years that have become substantial issues in the South. The area of plant invasions could expand from about 19 million acres now to about 27 million acres into the future. But those, those forecasts are, are, are highly variable depending on climate. And, and perhaps one of the more interesting aspects of, of the chapter on invasive plants is the linkage between climate and suitable habitat for various invasive species. Uh, th this chart here, which is going to be hard to read in any, any kind of meaningful way, I'll just give you a generic take on it, is looking at one particular um, invasive plant and then looking at uh, the, the effect of climate across the different scenarios on the suitable habitat for that um, for that invasive species um, to the year 2060, and you can see that that the darker areas are where we would expect to see strong growth uh, or high potential for for the, the the spread of that that particular species. I wish I could remember which one it was, um, but that it varies quite a bit between um, between those those climate realizations. So that that is one of the more uncertain elements of of uh, the future of invasive plants and insects and diseases. Several of the uh, the invasives uh, involve or lead to extirpation of species here. Uh, the extirpation of red bay as a result of laurel wilt disease that is moving uh, extremely, extremely fast. Um, I was just looking at uh, a map of the spread of laurel wilt uh, today, the most recent detection monitoring map, and uh, up in Virginia, that that area that shows 2020, uh, they're they're already uh, in in 2011 and the first part of 2012, there have been occurrences identified in that particular in that particular area. So it is growing faster than we even thought a year ago. Um, other other examples of extirpation would be the hemlock woolly adelgid and and the influence on on southern Appalachian um, hemlocks. Uh, two weeks ago, I was in the Linville Gorge taking a hike, and it was just amazing, the uh, discouraging the, the devastation to that species in that in that region. There's also others that are on the horizon, and um, you know, if, if there was ever a great name for a forest threat, it would be sudden oak death. Um, and clearly, it's been an issue in 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 the west. Uh, in, along the west coast, uh, and there's been quite a bit of work on trying to understand the predicted suitability uh, for, for sudden oak death in, in the um, in the east. It's not it's not here yet, but it it is something that that, that uh, causes pause and, and may be an issue in the future. A reminder that there there are likely to be other new arrivals um, in in the region within the next 10 years. Now I've talked about that. Oh, and happy to report that that chart that I couldn't remember is actually for tallow tree. Key finding number seven uh, is about fire. An extended fire season 
combined with obs obstacles to prescribed burning will increase wildland fire related hazards. Uh, we we made this uh, we announced this key finding in in uh, in May ahead of the uh, the fire season that we saw in Texas uh, this 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 past summer and um, <laughs> we're quoted in national media as having predicted it but but what what this this find what this this chapter does is it links the climate forecast uh, to to uh, some some fire. Uh, incidents forecasting. It suggests that, um, that on average, wildland fire potential would would increase over the next 50 years. But it, as we look at increased variability in climate, um, that major wildfire events would would likely occur more often. This would be something like the the uh, fire season that we saw in the in in Texas um, and Oklahoma this this past summer. Uh, but also would um, you know would include the uh, the fires the fires that we had in the um, the Okefenokee area in south southeastern Georgia in um, in 2007 and and some of the the other big fire fire years that we've had uh, over the last 20. Uh, we also looked at at the um, the capacity to to treat forests to to um, to use prescribed burning, um, and and found that that there are increasing number of restrictions throughout the south that that will likely uh, impede um, the the practice of prescribed burning, and also looked at the uh, the capacity for firefighting among private and state um, state organizations, and uh, observed that there's been a substantial reduction in that in that firefighting capacity. Key finding number eight is that private owners control forest futures and ownership patterns have become less stable. And I've already mentioned that um, private landowners hold more than 86% of forests and that uh, forest industry has gone through um, a long period of divestiture where, where much of the forest industry land has been, has been sold or transitioned to a new ownership institution uh, to the point where timber investment organizations and um, uh, uh, real estate investment trust to a certain extent are, are much more prevalent um, players in the commercial uh, forest ownership group. The chart here shows change between 1998 and 2008 and the strong decline in, um, in industry ownership and increase in uh, timber investment management organizations. Um, th that, that chart was generated before Weyerhaeuser became a REIT, uh, so there, the the change would be even more uh, more pronounced in a, in a 2010 or 2011 graph. So as a result, we see a new ownership type um, in the uh, commercial side of, of forest forest lands, um, and and it's perhaps best to view this as a, a, a change that that is likely to persist, in in the sense that um, now that forest land is held by by forest investment instruments. We should expect an increased churn or, or an increased turnover in, in the ownership of those lands. Uh, some of those lands are, are held in what are called closed end funds that require sale after a fixed period of time, five years, seven years, ten years, um, and, and provides for pen, potential for rapid change. In other words, um, you know, forest investors have come to forest land um, in, in large numbers. Because of the you know, perception that that it's a countercyclical investment, uh, if if that perception were to change, we could see um, a retreat um, and and a big change in the ownership of, of that of that group as well. Skip a couple. I'm going to skip that one. Key finding number nine. The the Futures Project includes a chapter that looks at uh, species of conservation concern, the effect of, of various forces of change on wildlife habitat and on species imperilment and endangerment. Um, and this is one way of summarizing it. Uh, there, there's a wealth of information there. But if we looked across the threats to uh, species of conservation concern, they're widespread, but they're especially concentrated in two regions. One is the coastal plain, and the other is the Appalachian-Cumberland 
subregion. Um, in the coastal plain, we have uh, a number of factors that could um, could lead to additional pressure on on the species of conservation concern, um, from rising sea levels to intensifying management, spreading invasive species, and perhaps most importantly, uh, urbanization in in that in that region, where we see an awful lot of urbanization in the in the coasts and the lower coastal flatwoods. The Appalachian Cumberland is another is the other subregion that contains a large number of of species of conservation concern, um, especially amphibians, and this is coincident with development and and other um, invasive species that are affecting habitat. The um, another way to look at um, the, the vertebrate species of concern is to look across taxa, and um, these are the different levels of uh, conservation concern from vulnerable to critically imperiled. And a quick scan of these these first four here indicate that amphibians are far and away the most dominant, or are, are the taxa with with the most um, species of conservation concern, and those are largely concentrated in coastal and in mountain habitats. Skip that. And key finding number 10. I'm sure you were hoping I was going to get to number 10 sooner. <laughs> um, is that increasing populations are likely to increase demand for forest based recreation, but that the availability of land to meet those needs is forecasted to decline? Um, and we start the, the analysis by looking at the availability of public land for recreation in the South and compare it with other regions of the country. And there's just a, a, a very strong scarcity of, of public lands to meet recreation demands within this, this region. Uh, there, there are a couple of implications. There, there are likely to be increasing demands on those public lands, the national forest in particular, uh, but also national parks and state parks. But this also might, might encourage uh, private landowners to try to uh, realize the benefits of of uh, providing recreation opportunities, uh, bringing more revenue to, to forests, and 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 uh, perhaps providing more incentive to retain forest cover uh, to the extent that they can capture revenue from from recreation streams. Um, so I I'd like to conclude with um, a couple of slides here. Looked across. Um, a number of, of factors that are influencing southern forests and uh, looked at, um, at several implications. Uh, we see that, that many of them are operating on on the land base of the of the region, um, but I'd like to think of it in terms of uh, time frame. Uh, the short run changes, the things that I I think we, we should expect to be of dominant um, Influence over the, the next 10 years is is largely um, focused on population uh, urbanization and forest loss. You know that's that is that is a dynamic that is happening in real time. Um, I think we've had a bit of a pause due to the uh, due to the recession. Uh, economic recovery, I'm willing to project, would uh, would lead to a, um, a return to the growth rates that we saw over the previous decade. Uh, growing wildfire hazards. I think the uh, the intersection of urbanization and and forest, the wildland urban interface, growing um, is is likely to to lead to strong issues with respect to wildfire, uh, um, coincident with population, but also the issues that we described with respect to um, a loss of funding for for firefighting um, in private and public institutions. Um, Will, will be felt and realized here in the short run. And then the ownership dynamics. I think ownership dynamics uh, have the potential to change um, over the next 10 years, but again, that depends on, on how, how economic conditions play out. In the medium run, the, uh, the issue of concern to many is, is how, will, how will markets develop for fiber? Uh, how, how will forest product markets change? And, and will we have... Um, some some um, expanded role for wood in in the energy sector. 
uh, that that's a key issue um, again unlikely to play out in strong fashion over the next 10 years but within 20 years um, a, a very important factor water impacts uh, the water stress indices indicate that within 20 years we would see some strong strong increase in water stress um, in, in many areas of the south and begin to realize additional biodiversity impacts especially in the coastal plain the longer run changes um, are 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 climate and invasive plants so we, we expect the short run changes population urbanization to continue to play out over the next 50 years um, but that coupled with climate change would likely have strong influence on forest conditions later in this projection period. Invasive plants uh, likewise um, seem to be um, gathering steam, but, but our projections suggest that, that their, their strong influence on ecosystem condition and productivity perhaps would occur um, at toward the end of the time frame. Oh, so so you know, maybe this is the great caveat. Um, you know, I, the the thing to say about, about forecasting is that, or to start with, when you're talking about forecasting, is that all forecasts are going to be wrong. So none of the scenarios that we've that we've uh, generated are likely to be correct. Um, but what we've we've gone on the assumption that that we've constructed a plausible range, or a useful range of of forecasts for thinking about the future and and how things could evolve. Uh, but there are things out there that could could change um, that could change everything, and uh, it's worth thinking about what those game changers might be. Um, one of them would be a very rapid acceleration of renewable portfolio standards and and strong federal energy policies that that could affect the um, the demand for for forest products and energy sector. Uh, we could be wrong about climate change. You know, we've looked across a, a set of four climate realizations for this analysis for RPA. We look at nine climate realizations, but there is a chance that that climate uh, could change in a in a um, in a volatile fashion, and uh, and and we haven't captured that. Another potential game changer is. Um, absolutely no recovery of the wood product demands, uh, loss of productive capacity um, in, in, in the region, or at least in the, in the wood using sector of the region. And again, this is just outside the range of what, of what, we've, um, of what we've looked at, but if we, if we didn't see a strong recovery in, in wood products over the next six, seven years, that would change uh, the conditions and, and cause us to rethink our scenarios. And finally, we could have accelerated economic and policy growth um, in the South um, following this winter that, that that we haven't that we haven't accounted for here. So I think this is my last slide. Um, you know, we face a number of challenges uh, in the forest sector. Um, developing monitoring systems that that examine. Uh, anticipated changes. I think this is this is um, sort of the flip side of looking to the future. Is is that if you if you use a futuring analysis to define where you think important changes are likely to occur, uh, then it probably behooves you to to use that information to design monitoring systems that that are more focused in those areas where where you anticipate change. Sort of test the um, test the hypothesis from the forecasts. Um, Another challenge is, is is targeting our research to to anticipate future needs. Uh, this is something that the Southern Research Station is attempting to do, using the Futures Project as a way to you know, sort through what the the research priorities might be, given the influence of change on ecosystem services that people care about. Um, third is is developing conservation strategies to meet changing conditions. Um, conservation strategies. Um, you know, I, I think they are evolving um, uh, in this century. But um, you know, if you look at where you expect the forest to be 20 years from now, you might have a different strategy with respect to uh, species of concern. Um, uh, you know, you, you would do triage in terms of, of um, defining habitats that that um, need protection or or monitoring a little bit more. Uh, carefully, I think. And finally, 
uh, translating these uh, these projections and concerns into forest management and restoration strategies that uh, not only look at what is scarce today but anticipates scarcity in the future but also anticipates change in growing conditions or um, social conditions um, in the future is is the next step in the, the futures project and the focus of phase two. So with that, yes, I've reached the end.